Dr. Ken Calvert talking about some of his uh, work, which uh, can be considered part of his best work. And so, uh, Ken, you've got the floor. If you want to share your screen, um, let me uh, make that possible for you. Hold on here. Okay, yeah, I will need to share the screen. Okay, you should be able to now. Uh, select window or screen, okay. <laughs> it's all new to uh, all of us. Entire screen, let's try that. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it's there. Okay. So uh, thanks, and thanks, Rafi, for setting this up. I'm really, uh, this is a great turnout. So um, first is the question about what does best mean? And I'm going to talk about the work that led to my uh, three most cited papers, according to Google Scholar. And these three papers have more uh, have more than half of all of my total citations, okay? And you'll notice that they're all uh, more than 25 years, or almost 25 years old. So this is work that I did with uh, various people, mostly, well, my, my colleague at Georgia Tech, Ellen Zagora, and uh, some of our students over, over time. So, you know, I don't know that I can, I would consider this my best work, but arguably it's the work that's had the most impact. So, uh, you know, this is, I don't know that this really qualifies as keeping current, but um, a couple of weeks ago, Merrick uh, encouraged me to do this. So I, I after he mentioned the Stanford graph base, so, um, uh, and I, uh, didn't realize this was actually going to happen until last night. So I kind of threw this together and, and some of it required going back in time to look up stuff that I had actually forgotten about. Um, so many of you were probably not born in 1995 uh, or some of you anyway were not born in 95 or were toddlers. Um, you know, the Internet was just becoming a thing then. I mean, researchers knew about it and there was a lot of work in uh, networking research going on then, but it really hadn't penetrated to the general population very much. Uh, the, the hot topics in those days are quality of service, um, measurement of real networks, uh, especially network traffic. Uh, security was becoming a thing. SSL was actually developed at Netscape. Um, in the 95 and 96 time frame and released without really becoming an official standard. It didn't become an official standard in the IETF until much later. Um, and then multicast was a hot topic. And uh, in particular, how to do reliable multicast and multicast routing. So just to give you a quick refresher on uh, internet multicast service, it is a an abstraction mechanism allowing group communication. So uh, in the internet context, there is a special class of IP addresses that represent multicast addresses. And the idea is that receivers can explicitly join one of these addresses by signaling their local router. There's a protocol that you can signal that you want to join a particular a uh, group represented by one of these special addresses. <coughs> and uh, the routers in the network have to store state about where the receivers are for every one of these groups. And when someone sends a message with the destination address equal to this special IP address, uh, the routers have to duplicate that uh, message, that packet, and send it wherever it needs to go so that it gets to all receivers on a, on a best effort basis. So the idea is that this group address hides the number and location so the sender doesn't have to keep track of it and then the network does that for the sender, just like it does with unicast addresses. The big challenge here, and the reason this was a research uh, topic, 
was that there are millions of possible multicast addresses and every one of them could potentially have receivers anywhere in the internet. And uh, so that means that, and, and also anybody could send to any of these multicast addresses. So if you think about it, this address, this model really doesn't uh, scale very well. And that's why we don't have internet wide multicast today. In fact, we don't even really have uh, much local multicast beyond uh, your local area network that you're connected to. But it was a hot topic in those days. So uh, when people were looking at these routing algorithms in general, and in particular multicast routing algorithms, uh, the performance of the algorithm typically measured in the number of hops a packet would have to be transmitted over uh, depends on the network structure. And uh, we talk about the network topology. When we talk about topology modeling, what we mean is the interconnection of the routers, the network elements, uh, by channels. And we always represent that, of course, as a graph. And when we evaluate these routing algorithms, we typically would run them on random graphs. And there are various kinds of random graphs. Uh, the pure random graph just uh, specifies a number of nodes and then decides uh, randomly whether there's an edge between two no nodes according to some uh, probability, which is either a constant for the whole graph uh, or if, if you're making multiple graphs, uh, the, the, that constant might be chosen to be a function of the number of nodes. So, and there's well-known result which says that uh, if you want the graph to be connected with high probability, then that constant should be proportional to, uh, the, I think it's n log n, uh, where n is the number of nodes. A geometric random graph, uh, you randomly place the nodes in Euclidean space, and that's what I've illustrated here. And then you place an edge with a probability that depends on the Euclidean distance between the nodes. Um, at the time of uh, that I'm talking about, in the mid-90s, a lot of people were using these Waxman graphs. And Waxman had, in a 1988 paper on multi multicast routing, uh, defined this model where the probability of an edge was a decreasing exponential function of the distance between the nodes in, in a plane. So, a bit of personal history. In the summer of 1995, uh, I was at Georgia Tech. Uh, at Georgia Tech, we were on nine-month contracts. Faculty were on nine-month contracts, but you could not spread your pay. Uh, Georgia Tech w didn't pay you over 12 months. They paid you only for the nine months of your contract. And uh, I was working at Bell Labs in Homedale that summer, staying in the basement of a friend for a couple of months. Uh, consulting. And in the evenings, I was working with uh, my colleagues and our student, Bobby Bhattacharji, who's now a professor at the University of Maryland, uh, on a paper, and we were comparing some different multicast routing algorithms. And I haven't been able to figure out what, what paper that was. Um, Nothing in, in terms of the timing, nothing really lines up. It may have ended up just being a tech report. I'm not sure. But as we were working on this paper to, to compare, we, we had implemented the algorithms and we were trying to compare them. And it occurred to me that people were using all these flat graph models um, and they don't look anything like the internet. And so, um, I decided to do something better, and I, after a couple of late nights, I had put together this transit stub model uh, for internet topology. So, um, just a quick review of the structure of the internet. Uh, it's made up of 
these autonomous systems, uh, think internet service provider, uh, each one of those is, uh, each internet service provider controls a bunch of routers and channels uh, and interconnects with other internet service providers to make the entire global internet. And there are sort of two kinds of these ASs. Transit ASs carry traffic between other ASs. In other words, if you open up a transit AS, you can find uh, packets in there that don't originate or terminate. Uh, neither their source nor destination is inside that AS. Um, if, it's, if it's not a transit AS, then it's a stub, what we call a stub uh, autonomous system. And that means that if you open that up, you should only find packets that have either a source address or a destination address that's contained within that uh, autonomous system. And there's kind of this routing invariant that says traffic between hosts that are connected to the same autonomous system does not leave that autonomous system. Okay, so uh, there's this locality principle in routing in the internet. And the, the problem was that these flat graphs were not uh, respecting this, this sort of locality principle. So uh, I came up with this way of generating these transit stub models, and this is completely simple. Uh, it's a homework problem, okay? Uh, so the first thing you do is create a random geometric graph. You put nodes in the Euclidean plane and, and just use the standard geometric graph model. And then you expand each one of those nodes into another geometric subgraph of whatever size you would like that to be. So uh, create subgraphs. And uh, then you reconnect the edges uh, from the top level graph to nodes in the subgraph. And you can do that in various ways, either randomly or have them all connect in the same place. Uh, and then finally, you assign weights to the edges. So the shortest path algorithms, uh, if you use a standard Dijkstra or other shortest path algorithm, then the routing will obey the, the this locality principle. So that's the transit stub model, and I wrote some code to do that. Uh, like I say, it was a couple of late nights in the summer of, of 1995. So after we had submitted that paper, I was telling my one of my other students about this, Rich Clayton, and he said, you know, you should look at the Stanford graph base this and so I did and uh, this is where what Merrick had mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the Stanford graph base that he and uh, VTech had used in their work uh, and it was uh, a really nice contribution it was written by Don Knuth and I think one of his students uh, it was written in CWeb and if you've never encountered C-Web, you should uh, do a search for literate programming and read what's there. Um, you can also search for the Stanford graph base, and I think you can still download the tarball. Uh, but you will have to install C-Web, which is uh, two tools called C-Tangle and C-Weave. Uh, basically, literate programming is about writing the um, uh, documentation and the code together. And there's a whole uh, philosophy behind it that we shouldn't keep documentation and code separately, that they should be together. I, I happen to agree with that. Uh, I have to say that uh, the C-Web tools are a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a hurdle to get over to use those. Anyway, GraphBase is really useful once you get it installed. It provides nice data structures for representing all kinds of graphs. 
a library of routines for creating graphs, including random graphs, and for manipulating graphs. Uh, you can attach essentially arbitrary information to the nodes and the edges of the graph. And the, this is the part that I think Merrick and Victor were using. It also includes a whole bunch of data sets uh, for testing and demonstrating combinatorial or graph algorithms. So that includes uh, all the five letter words in the English language, uh, relationship between characters of classic books like Anna Karenina and David Copperfield, where uh, if two characters appear on the same page, then they are uh, connected by an edge. Uh, the scores from all the college football games of the 1990 uh, college football season, uh, including the teams, and et cetera, et cetera. And there's a quote from Knuth. Uh, he kind of wrote the book to demonstrate literate programming, uh, and each Example is a programmatic essay. So there's a whole bunch of solutions to interesting problems here. Um, so uh, it's worth taking a look at the Stanford graph base. And by the way, if anybody, uh, I, I can't find my copy of the book. So if anybody's seen it, please let me know. I used to have a copy. So we looked at Stanford graph base, said, yeah, this is good. So we re implemented uh, the tools and generalize them so that you could uh, have multiple levels of your, of your of domain structure. You could control the sizes of the subgraphs, number of uh, nodes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we added some tools for computing diameter, or maybe those are in the graph base, I can't remember. Um, we, we definitely wrote a wrapper to, to create transit strub transit stub graphs using the graph-based tools. Uh, and then we made it available via FTP. That was originally before the World Wide Web was a big thing, but um, we did put it on the web. It's still on the web. If you Google Georgia Tech Internet Topology Models, uh, I think Ellen Zagura's web page has something about it. Uh, then we wrote this Infocom 96 paper, um, and at some point, I think it was around 2000, uh, the people who maintained NS2, the network simulator that essentially everybody in networking research uses to do packet level simulations, uh, they included GTITM as part of it, and I think that led to a lot of people using it and citing our papers. Um, while I was preparing this talk, I actually came across a paper I'd forgotten about from a workshop in 2003 that talked about uh, extensions, uh, an updated version that we released around 2003 uh, that included uh, improvements to let the, um, to, to handle larger models. So uh, originally, if you wanted to do a, forwarding table, computing the, the routes from every node to every other node, you know, you could handle up to a few hundred uh, nodes uh, in, the, in the full network. Uh, so we added tools to do abstraction and do a more realistic forwarding table and make it more scalable. And then we also collaborated with a guy named John Stasko and his student, uh, Egan, and they built uh, some modest uh, visual graph visualization capabilities that you could uh, interactively expand parts of the graph and, and look at it. So that's pretty much the story. Um, the takeaways, you know, I think best work is often in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it turned out that this paper in, in, in Infocom 96, How to Model an Inner Network, uh, was one of the first to talk about this, this question of how do we model the internet and what does it really look like? What's a real, how do we think about a realistic model uh, of the internet topology? 
and how do we represent that? And that led to quite a few papers on that question. Uh, I, and that third paper on my first list there, comparing models of internet topology was, was our contribution to that. Um, we looked at various characteristics. Other people since then have come up with better improved characteristics uh, looking at, at sort of second and third order aspects of the graph structure. Second turn takeaway, uh, sometimes a problem is out there not and hasn't been solved. There's no general or, or available solution, not because it's hard, but just because nobody has taken the time to sit down and solve it and make that available. So I think we see this pretty often that some of the most impactful work that people do, um, and I apologize for using the word impactful, I shouldn't have done that, but some, sometimes the way to have impact is just to solve your own problem and then share the solution. Uh, and that goes, especially if you can write code and make it easy for others to use. And I will say that uh, I think the Stanford graph base uh, I think it probably helped with that, although, because it gave us a, a set of, um, a library of tools that were sort of vetted and had been, had been out there. Uh, the fact that people had to download these other two or three packages to use it. Now, now, of course, all of this is automated. In those days, that was a little bit harder because uh, people had to go get those tools and, and install them first. Um, oh, and another thing I'll say is that the Stanford graph base, it, the, the code was in C. Um, in those days, the machines were all 32-bit machines. And some of the data structures actually depend sort of in, crucially on the size of uh, various data types. And so uh, the graph base has not, as far as I know, been updated for 64-bit machines. Um, and I don't actually know if it, how well it works with 64-bit machines today, unfortunately. Because unfortunately with C, um, you know, the only thing you can say is that uh, a long is no shorter than a short. Uh, and a long, long is no shorter than a long. So um, that's so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, let me just point out that uh, uh, this is a, a great example of uh, uh, tool building. You used existing tools, and uh, you built new tools out of those. That is, you took the graph-based tool and you ended up with a tool for building uh, networks that other people could then use to do simulations or investigations. And that's a lot of what we do, those of us who are in the systems area, which I prefer to call the tool building area, where we build tools out of other tools so that other people can build on that. So there's an enormous amount of tool building going on, and most of my career has been building various tools. Uh, anyone want to ask yep. a question? Yes, uh, a quick question. Um, so uh, I understand, uh, of course, uh, the role such system plays in experimentation. Uh, why couldn't people just have taken uh, a snapshot of internet as it used uh, as it looked then? Uh, and use the, this network, the actual network, or fragments of it for experimentation? Ah, that's a great question. Um, well, one reason is because nobody knows. Okay, there was not, there was no such snapshot. And one reason there is not is because these autonomous systems, these service providers, are very, um, uh, they don't like to reveal the internal structure of their network because that's part of their competitive advantage uh, against their, their competition. So uh, this is one of the strange things about the internet is these internet service providers uh, have to compete with each other 
and they don't have very many dimensions in which they can do that. So one of those is the way they build their network and their network structure and their, their routing. So um, at that time, there really wasn't a good understanding of what the internet looks like. And there were other projects that came out. I don't remember. I think they were probably already going by the time we did this, but things like uh, the route views database, which collects information about interdomain routing. Uh, the, the domain level or autonomous system level paths that uh, packets follow, um, it is possible to build that map, but the internal structure of the autonomous systems is generally opaque to the outside world. All right. Well, uh, actually, let, let me mention one other thing. And there's been work on how to figure it out. So there's a tool called Rocket Fuel that was done in the, I think, the late 2000s uh, that does let you infer something about the internal structure. And you can, uh, you can use tools like Traceroute to find the, the, the list of routers that a packet goes through, uh, but it's very hard to scale that up to the, to the whole topology of the internet. Good. Uh, so I, I have more questions, Ken, but I will ask them when we meet. Uh, this will this will take place, uh, of course, eventually. So uh, I yep. will ask them. Well, thank you very much. Um, if there are other questions, uh, then you can certainly direct them directly to Ken and to Jacob. Um, I'm going to leave the meeting, but if people want to stick around in the meeting, that's fine. I do not have anything yet on the schedule for next week. Um, if someone would like to step forward and um, suggest a topic, I'll be glad to schedule next week's Keeping Current. Until then, uh, stay safe and stay in touch. Bye. Bye. Uh